Hi, I'm Prakasha, and on behalf of my co-authors, Nadira Nausher, Oin Utshab Boito, Nisra Jahan Meem, Istia Ahmed, and Tayabul Hawk, I'm here to present our paper, Computing and the Stigma Text, Trust, Surveillance, and Spatial Politics with the Sex Workers in Bangladesh. I'd like to begin by showing you some insights about sex work worldwide. While sex work is illegal in most countries, there are 42 million sex workers worldwide, and this is a $186 billion industry. This number is booming with the rise of digital sex work after the pandemic. Global South countries account for over 25% of the total number of sex workers. However, there is a lack of empirical research and data concerning the sex workers in this region. As a result, the discourse around sex work and technology often centers on data from the West, where the users are proficient in tech and they utilize platforms like OnlyFans, scamming and subscription sites, etc. This overlooks the realities faced by sex workers in the Global South, where limited resource and tech literacy, patriarchy, conservatism, and religious restrictions shape their experiences. We argue that much of the digital space used by the sex workers is deeply inflected by their politics, the cultures, and the material practices. And this all takes place outside the digital space. Hence, we cannot completely understand the sex workers not their digital lives, online practices, or safety strategies from a topographic or physical point of view. Rather, we have to see and evaluate their lives in a whole spatial setting that comprises of both their physical and digital landscapes. For our research, we chose Bangladesh, a South Asian country housing the world's largest brothel village. Despite being legal, sex work carries stigma due to cultural and religious sentiments here. Approximately, one in every thousand people in Bangladesh is involved in sex work. Moreover, platforms like OnlyFans are banned in Bangladesh, adding further complexity to the digital landscape for sex workers. So we set three goals for our research. We want to understand the cultural values and the societal challenges faced by the sex workers in Bangladesh, and we want to explore how these values and challenges shape their online presence and security practices. Finally, we want to identify the scope for designing technologies that cater to their needs. To answer these questions, we traveled to the Dawlatiya Brothel in Rajpari. It is located 137 km west from the capital city, Dhaka, and it is home to more than 2,000 legal sex workers. The brothel is monitored by local police. We conducted a three-month-long ethnography with 25 sex workers in the Dawlatiya Brothel, including in-depth interviews, and informal discussions with local NGO representatives and digital service providers. In May 2023, two female NGO representatives, one a former sex worker, assisted us in the field. She also helped us interview, review, and prepare the questionnaire. We asked the participants about their daily lives, client interactions, technology use, challenges, and safety measures. We observed them extensively and asked questions during various activities. Interviews were audio recorded, transcribed, translated, anonymized, and analyzed using open coding and thematic analysis. Participants aged from 19 to 41. They earned $400 to $800 monthly on average. Only 10 had formal schooling, and all were native Bengali speakers from different parts of the country. From our data, five key findings emerged. These are primary factors shaping the online and offline lives of the sex workers. First, we talk about trust. The initial trust between sex workers and the clients begins with face-to-face -face interactions. Our participants favor well-behaved clients and only share their phone numbers with those who treat them respectfully and pay fairly. They feel more secure when clients are referred by known contacts. To maintain trust, participants maintain regular communication with clients offering casual online services such as sexual activities via audio calls to their trusted clients. Particularly intriguing is the third method of nurturing trust, where 22 participants instinctively trusted tech savvy customers more, believing their expertise could improve technological literacy and financial gain. We will delve deeper into this on the next slide. Workers share their digital and financial credentials, believing that their clients have their best interests at heart and can help them increase earnings. For instance, one participant's client taught her to create separate Facebook accounts for work and personal use, secured her profiles, and blocked family members from the work account for her safety. She reasoned, he's done all this for my safety. 
Why shouldn't I put more trust on him? Some participants engaged in cryptocurrency trading, which is illegal in Bangladesh, and other online activities introduced by clients, despite even knowing what cryptocurrency is. One of our participants said, he installed the software on my phone. He said, if I click on this button every day, I will earn a chunk of money. He was the best for me, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't have told me about this money-making opportunity. That's why I trust him. For those using digital platforms, trust works differently. They use apps like Bigolive, Likey, TikTok, and Emo to promote themselves and find new clients. However, participants noted that trust cannot be achieved online unless they can physically meet and observe the client in real life. Workers disguise their involvement in sex work by presenting themselves as online work providers to attract clients. They offer their contact numbers to individuals seeking passive online income. The figure shows how a participant doodled their phone number on her live stream to attract potential work seekers. After sharing their phone numbers online, they receive numerous calls and engage with prospective clients, but they do not perform any professional activities until conducting any in-person screening. Among the trustworthy clients, the workers choose the most suitable candidate who is a powerful entity with significant political, administrative, and financial clouds. It is to form an intimate, committed, and enduring relationship, metaphorically referred to as their pseudo-husband. Any sex worker without a pseudo-husband is vulnerable to rape, sex trafficking, or even murder. However, the pseudo-husband gradually starts exerting power and control on the workers over their use of digital media. One participant said, he installed a software on my phone to track all my calls and online activities. I used to talk with my friends and clients on that smartphone. I often found it scary when he could tell whom I have talked to, exactly what I have said to them over the phone. I thought he had some superpower, but later he told me about the software on my phone. He also used to beat me up, tie my hands, and even choke me if I had talked to any clients over the phone. I cannot even delete the software because if I do, he would suspect me more and I would lose all his support. The workers employ different strategies to avoid this monitoring by hiding information and sometimes deleting data, like their call histories, messages, etc. 23 out of 25 of our participants maintain dual lives due to the stigma around sex work. They use separate handsets or SIM cards and maintain different Facebook accounts for work and personal use. They employ fake names, log their work profiles, and avoid adding family members. When visiting family, they delete call history, images, messages, and uninstall messaging apps like email. Sometimes they keep their phone switched off. As one of our participants said, my work profile does not have any posts. I just add my existing clients there for audio or video chat. My real profile has photos with my son, my village photos, and I have put my son's photo as my profile picture. I never add my clients there. Both the profiles are locked. Sex workers in Dalutia have voter ID cards registered with their Potitapulli in English brothel as their address. Due to fear of exposure, they avoid seeking government aid, opening bank accounts, filing work-related complaints, or availing any kind of online citizen facilities because these require their ID reports. Stigmatization through spatial separation is common in brothels like Dorothea. Workers there attempt to connect with the city whenever possible. They use digital platforms to overcome some spatial tensions, though physical separations remain challenging. In our interviews, they mentioned how they deliberately organized their rooms, mimicking a regular household woman. One of our participants said, if people see lights and flashy decorations, they might suspect the place where I am or what my profession is. Any ordinary woman would not likely have access to these expensive decoration props. You see the cooking utensils behind me. This stays in my background when I record video. This is more likely for a housewife to have cooking utensils around her, and so people will not suspect me. I don't ever remove those. The workers look for alternative locations and contexts that do not express any spatial resemblance to our brother's public spaces. Here in the left photo, 
you can see the room of a sex worker resembling the setting of a typical Bangladeshi household. It also has a poster of the Holy Kaaba Sharif on the right wall. The right photo shows a cooking corner adjacent to a worker's room, used as backdrop for live streaming. Despite societal, societal labels of immorality, the workers in the brothel has their own moral values consistent with their own understanding. Here, we see different levels of morality. Sexting and engaging in sexual conversations with long-term clients are common practices among our participants, but it is not considered as formal sex work to them. Some participants subtly incorporate sensuality into videos on TikTok and like, viewing it as normal online behavior. Our participants do not use any conventional online platforms that are designed for sex workers. One worker expressed herself like this, doing sex work on online video platforms is the greatest thing. We can do it inside these four walls, that's acceptable to us. But doing it in a pla public platform, oh no, it's totally a shame. I cannot even think about this. Again here, we observe that the notion of space plays an important role in the lives of sex workers, this time shaping their morality. Our findings reveal that participants' computing practices are intertwined with their material lives. Hence, socio-technical arrangements may become difficult in these communities facing societal stigma, highlighting designing challenges. HCI's focus on personalization may need design adjustment to accommodate individuals living multiple lives. Incorporating intelligent learning for better service provision. Technology design facilitating smooth transitions between identities in different contexts could benefit sex workers and others living multiple lives. Participants prioritize online privacy despite low digital literacy using pseudonyms and deleting call records. Pseudo husbands surveil sex workers by demanding access to their phones and passwords and tracking their activities without consent. This evolving role of male partners in technology facilitated abuse in patriarchal environments needs further exploration. But why should we bother considering insights from this tiny contextualized place? Digitization in this region, like globally, has sparked hypermobility in this bound place, integrating it into broader globalization. Despite its size, the brothel plays a significant role in digitally globalized platforms and markets. Understanding sex workers' engagement, risks, negotiations, and safety strategies online within their spatial bubble can inform more inclusive and deliberate design approaches. This paper are just future exploration in design to protect sex workers in the global south who have limited resources. Urban planners should prioritize preserving local businesses, especially those in and around red light districts, where workers feel safer than on online platforms. This study can also be expanded to understand similar bounded places, even in non-marginalized settings. Specifically, when Bangladeshi sex workers' sexual appeal is showcased on digital plat platforms like OnlyFans alongside others worldwide, what kind of global politics emerges? How do Bangladeshi customers' preferences change when they're transitioning from local brothels to online platforms? What implications does this have for the political economy of sex work in Bangladesh? The emergence of urban sex workers in this region and their use of online platforms could also be a novel direction for future studies. We recognize our outsider perspective and potential biases, despite efforts to gather diverse perspectives and maintain confidentiality due to the vulnerability and stigma faced by this community. Certain data, such as details about pseudo-husbands or online interactions, were intentionally avoided to minimize risks. We refrain from generalizing our findings beyond the specific context and time frame of this research. Despite these limitations, we believe that our study provides HCI with an important account of one of the world's most vulnerable and stigmatized communities and their interactions with computing technologies. Our findings do not only portray the complexities associated with their use of technologies and their creative workarounds, we also discuss possible design implications for HCI to make computing more inclusive and accommodating of the unique needs of such communities. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation, and we look forward to continuing our efforts to advocate for the digital rights and well-being of the sex workers around the world. For further questions, please email me or my co-authors at the given email address. We warmly welcome your thoughts and suggestions. Thank you again.